Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Oliver Reihart, Director of Fellowship here at the RSA, and I'm delighted to welcome you all for today's very special lunchtime talk. Just before we begin, could I ask you to make sure your mobile phones are switched to silent? And also, we'll be filming today and live streaming over the web. So welcome to all, all those who are watching online. And a reminder that our hashtag is hashtag RSA information uh, if you want to get involved in the discussion on Twitter. So now that housekeeping notices are over, I'm very, it's my great pleasure to introduce this afternoon's distinguished guest speaker, David Levitin. Is that right, Levitin? Um, Daniel, Daniel Levitin, sorry, good start. As many of you will know well, Daniel is an award-winning scientist, musician, and author. He is professor of psychology and behavioral neuroscience at McGill University in Montreal, where he runs the laboratory, laboratory for music, cognition, perception, and expertise. He is the author of three consecutive best-selling books, This Is Your Brain on Music, The World in Six Songs, and his new book, the subject of our session today, The Organized Mind. In the book, and in his talk for us today, Daniel looks at a problem that besets every one of us, I'm sure, how to keep up and think straight in our current age of information overload. Deluged by, deluged by data and subject to constant demands on our attention, are there insights from the science of the brain that could help us better organize this flood of information? And if so, how we can harness this understanding to be more efficient, creative, happy, and less stressed in our increasingly wired world. Daniel, we're delighted that you've been able to join us and presumably add even more information to our cluttered minds. So please welcome me in joining Daniel Levitin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm delighted to be here and to see you here. Um, as Oliver said, I have a new book out. It's called The Organized Mind. Um, and you might be wondering, why did I write the book? Uh, I wrote the book that I wanted to read. Uh, I'm, I'm a scientist uh, in part of my life, and in, in the other part of my life, I'm an artist. I have been a musician for many years. I've been songwriting for 35 years. I still perform actively. I, have a, I did a show with Ben Folds, for those of you who know the Ben Folds Five, uh, just a couple of months ago. And I have a show with Roseanne Cash in a few weeks. Uh, daughter of Johnny Cash, great songwriter in her own right. Uh, and so juggling the scientific and the artistic, uh, I wanted to figure out uh, how can I make the most of my time so that I'm not spinning my wheels, I'm not wasting time. And I got every book that I could possibly find in the bookstore and in the library. Uh, I read uh, Getting Organized in 30 Days, Getting Organized in 7 Days, <laughs> Get Organized Now. <laughs> 20 steps to becoming more organized, five steps to becoming more organized, uh, read this book now, I mean, all these different things. And what I was astonished to find was that none of them were based on any evidence whatsoever. Uh, they were just people talking about what happened to work for them. And there was no reason to believe that it might work for me. Uh, and so I wanted to look deeply into the science of cognitive neuroscience of attention and memory and productivity. Fortunately, my training is as a cognitive neuroscientist, so uh, I was able to make my way through the 4,000 papers or so uh, in just a couple of years and extract some information. Um, and then I realized what was missing from what I wanted to read in a book was what people actually do. Not what science says you should do, although I, I think that's important, but what do people actually do, successful people? So I reached out to my network, and a friend introduced me to another friend, and so on. So I said, oh, you have to talk to this person. Uh, and I ended up talking to a lot of painters, sculptors, uh, musicians, composers, um, Nobel Prize winners, uh, members of the Obama White House, uh, you know, cabinet members, chairmen, uh, people in the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, politicians from around the world, as well as CEOs. I spoke to the the heads of some of the largest companies in the world. And most interestingly, um, I spoke to their executive assistants at great length. And they were far more helpful and interesting <laughs> than the CEOs. It, 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 how it happened was, you know, I would get the contact and I would call. And of course, the president of the company doesn't answer the phone it's the, or the email, for that matter. It's the executive assistant. And the, um, the EAs, Usually, when you're trying to get to the president, you know, the EA is just an annoyance, right? You, you don't want to talk to him or her. 
But in fact, for the kind of research I'm doing, that's exactly who I wanted to talk to. So I got their boss's permission for me to talk to them extensively. And they, they gave me so many great ideas, uh, which found their way into the book, uh, provided that what they were doing was based on the science that I had uncovered. So uh, that's the reason I wrote the book. And um, I guess I'll just talk about a few uh, just representative kinds of things that, that come from the research and from the conversations. Um, to begin with, this really is an age of information overload. And I think it's important that we recognize and identify that, that we're being bombarded by enormously larger amounts of information than ever before. Uh, we take in five times as much information every day on average as we did in 1986. That's the equivalent of 175 newspapers read cover to cover. In your leisure time alone, on average, you're taking in 34 gigabytes of data. Think about how many USB sticks that might be. Um, you uh, go grocery shopping. In 1976, the average grocery store had 9,000 unique items. Today, that same grocery store has 40,000 unique items. And because most of us get all of our shopping needs met in 150 items, uh, not the same ones, but 150 items per person, uh, you've got to ignore 38,500 items every time you go shopping. And that ignoring comes with some cognitive cost. Uh, it's because you know, you're not actually able to ignore something until you've paid attention to it long enough to know that you want to ignore it. And this sets up this cycle of decision making and, and stress and information bombardment. We've created a world that has 300 exabytes of human-made information. That's uh, 300 followed by 18 zeros. Uh, just a few years ago, Google estimates there were only 30 exabytes of human-made information. We've created more information in the last little while, last couple of years, than in all of human history before us. And we're assaulted by it every day. We're asked to do more. Uh, I think everybody feels that you're doing more, you have less free time to do what you want to do when you're at home, you're thinking about all the things you didn't do at work and all the unread emails. And when you're at work, you're thinking about all the things you didn't get to do at home or the leisure time you wanted to spend with friends and family. And you end up being in neither place fully. Your, your head is always partly somewhere else. And I think that's no way to live. Uh, it didn't used to be that way. And I think we need to take some steps to grab back that sense of gratification that you get from being immersed in one thing uh, and, and not doing something else. How many of you have been to dinner with a friend recently and you found that they spent a good portion of the dinner actually texting another friend who wasn't there at the dinner instead of actually being with you? Or you're talking to somebody on the phone and at some point you say, are, are you doing email while you're talking to me? You can tell that their attention has, has lagged a little bit. And you know, usually they say no, and they're lying. Uh, <laughs> or they'll sheepishly say yes, and then you'll get their attention for another minute or so until the email calls them back again. Um, what we're doing is multitasking, of course. And it's only in the last five years that neuroscientists have discovered that multitasking doesn't really exist. The brain simply doesn't work that way. Uh, what's actually happening is your brain is rapidly shifting its focus from one thing to the next. And because the neural switch operates so quickly, you don't really notice that you're shifting and it gives you the illusion of doing a bunch of things at once. This is actually very much uh, related neurophysiologically to the principle of how motion pictures work. Uh, you know, movies, traditional movies, celluloid movies, are a bunch of still images, right? And we play those still images at 25 frames per second, which just slightly exceeds the capacity of neurons for temporal resolution. And so what happens is your brain is fooled into thinking that there's continuous motion, even though they're individual scenes, individual uh, cells in a, in a, in a movie, uh, individual slides, really. So um, we're shifting so rapidly that we feel as though everything is fluid, uh, when in fact it's not. We're fractionating our attention into little itty bits. And all of that switching comes at a cost. And I know something about this because it was my laboratory that discovered the location of the switch, the neural switch that pushes you between activities. It's uh, in a structure called the insula, 
or if you put your hand at the top of your head, those of you who don't remember your introductory neuroanatomy, uh, <laughs> put your hand on the top of your head, it's a couple of inches below the center there, and the insula is what's doing all the switching. The problem is, as you might imagine, uh, when you get a neural switch to switch, it uses up resources, neural resources that are in limited supply. If only these things existed in unlimited supply, there'd be no problem, but they don't. Every time you ask this switch to operate in the insula, you're using up the same neural resources that you would need to solve a problem uh, or to get the energy to stay focused on something, uh, to come up with a creative solution to something. Uh, same nutrients, same neural resources. You're using them to switch, 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 switch. Uh, what we find in workplace studies is that people who will actually focus on a task uh, unitasking as opposed to multitasking, uh, at the end of the day, they feel like they got less done. But by every objective measure, they've been more productive, their work has been regarded by others, often their superiors, uh, as of higher quality and, and possessing greater creativity. The multitasker thinks they're being really good at it, but they're not. It's one of many neural illusions. The brain is, is very good at self-delusion. So much so that my colleague Mike Gazaniga calls the entire left hemisphere the great confabulator. All it does is make stuff up. And he, he's shown this in many studies. He's the one who pioneered uh, the studies you may have read about with split brain patients, patients who had their brain cut in two after a surgical procedure that was necessary. And when you show something, a picture, a movie, an object to the right hemisphere, and you ask the left hemisphere what's there, it doesn't have access to what the right hemisphere sees, so it just makes stuff up. <laughs> and you don't know that you're doing it. Uh, so uh, the left hemisphere is telling you you're a great multitasker. Don't believe it. Uh, so unitasking, uh, immersing yourself in activities uh, for uh, 40 minutes or an hour, not a bad thing. Uh, I, I happen to think that, you know, I, I can't imagine that, um, that Haydn or Shakespeare uh, were, or Picasso were creating their great works by, by doing it for about a minute and then going to talk to somebody and coming back for a minute and then going to check whether there's something in the mail and then going for another minute. I mean, creativity just doesn't work that way. The way it does work, we do shift back and forth, uh, but we're shifting to another mode. There's a creative mode of the brain that was just discovered uh, about 12 years ago by my colleague Marcus Rakel. Uh, he uncovered an entirely unknown neural network. I mean, we've, we've known it, uh, you know that it exists when I describe it, you know it's psychological reality. We didn't know that it was actually a distinct neural network that you could see in a brain scan and identify reliably across people and across time. We call it the daydreaming mode. This is the mode that you're, you're relaxed, you're not you're not doing anything in particular. You might be staring out the window. You might be reading a book and your mind has started watering and your eyes have been following the words but your brain's somewhere else. Uh, you uh, might be listening to music and you know, your thoughts meander from one to another. This is a great creative mode of thought. And it's the natural state of the brain. Unless you use your willpower uh, to stay focused on a task and blinkered, your brain's gonna get pulled into that mind wandering mode something that usually happens uh, whenever I give a talk. Uh, so the mind-wandering mode, so many of us fight against it because in this over-caffeinated age, we feel as though if we were to stop working for just five minutes, we'd fall irretrievably behind. And so we go pedal to the metal all day long until nighttime, right before bed. We're working, checking email, checking text every possible minute and we never give our brain a chance to enter its natural state, which is the mind-wandering mode. If you allow yourself to do that, you'll find it's tremendously restorative. It is the brain's natural state. So much so that Rakel, when he discovered it, called it the default mode of the brain. This is the part of the brain that is engaged in problem solving. You've all had the experience. I'm sure you were trying to figure out the solution to some problem. Uh, you can't figure it out and see so it you give up, you drop it. And then later, while you're shopping and trying to ignore 39,500 items, the solution comes to you just like that from out of nowhere. 
And in most cases, what's happened just before the solution came to you is that you were in the mind-wandering mode, your thoughts were just sort of meandering. And the reason the solution came to you is that the mind-wandering mode is making connections among things that you hadn't previously seen as connected, just like we do in the dream state. That's why we call it daydreaming. It's loosely connected thoughts, non-linear, not directed. So uh, it turns out for reasons we don't fully understand, but there's a neurochemical story there involving dopamine and acetylcholine and some other important neurotransmitters. Getting into the mind-wandering mode helps to push a kind of neural reset button in the brain. It replenishes your focused state, allows you to come back to work refreshed uh, with often new insight, uh, and, and the restoration of, of the neurochemicals that have been depleted by staying on task and by constant switching uh, task to task to task to task. Uh, as a kind of rule of thumb, uh, daydreaming could be 15 minutes every two hours. Not a bad idea. And in workplace studies, people who take these 15-minute breaks, at the end of the day, uh, like the unitaskers, the data are parallel, at the end of the day, they've gotten more done. They've more than compensated for the time they took off. Uh, they feel better. And uh, these breaks uh, it could be a nap, actually. Uh, for those of you who can take naps during the middle of the day, a 15-minute nap, not longer, because that'll release neurochemicals that can make you groggy for hours later. But 15 minutes, 20 max, um, can be the equivalent of an hour and a half sleep the night before and uh, can be the equivalent of an extra IQ, uh, 10 points in IQ, 15-minute nap uh, during the day. And these breaks confer the same advantage. Um, of course, when you're, when you're engaged in an artistic activity, whether it's, it's visual art or, or writing, literature, poetry, music, the breaks come more often than you realize. The typical way somebody writes, for example, a novelist, uh, you're writing, 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 and then you stop, and you, you, you sort of look off the page, and you're staring. Well, that's the mind-wandering mode kicking in. And you might be off for five seconds thinking, what's going to happen next? What would my character do next, right? Uh, or uh, what's this other character going to do in response to what this character just said? You might be off for five seconds. You come back. Uh, is that right? Does that really fit? You're off for 30 seconds, you come back, and there's this switching back and forth between the two modes. Um, it's not like task switching. It's not like you know, writing your novel, checking your email, writing your novel, checking your Twitter, writing your novel. Uh, uh, because remember, the mind-wandering mode is restorative. It's not depleting. So each time you go into there, you're actually increasing your productivity. So these are just some of the ideas. As you can see, there's a little bit of practical, a little bit of neuroscience. Some of the ideas that I discovered while trying to write the book that I wanted to read. Uh, and um, I'm going to end the sort of more formal part of our time together here and uh, invite you to, uh, to discuss with Oliver and I. I'm sorry, not Oliver and I, Oliver and me. And me, okay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> right. Well, thanks for that. It's a fascinating talk and lots of food for thought. I just wanted to start with a few questions for me. And the first one that came to mind was you said that multitasking doesn't exist. Um, but there's this perhaps myth that women are better multitasking than men, better multitasking than men. And I wondered if there was any kind of gender differences or cultural differences um, in the ability to organize our mind. Great question. So... Uh, women aren't better at multitasking because nobody's good at multitasking. But what women tend to be better at is task switching. Women are more rapid switchers. And you can imagine an evolutionary reason for why that might be if they were in charge of, of child care, you know, historically speaking. So um, women have evolved neurochemical and neurophysiological ways to switch tasks uh, much more rapidly uh, than men. So, you know, professions for which women would be especially suited would be air traffic controller, uh, journalist, broadcast journalist, uh, investigative journalist, publicist, uh, the, uh, simultaneous translator at the UN, things that require rapid shifting uh, that men simply aren't as good at. And it's no accident that most publicists that you find 
uh, across industries are women. Great. Thank they're, they're better at it. Yeah. And there's a scientific proof that that's right. true. Um, yeah, the other thing that brought to mind was education, actually. And I remember sitting in a classroom where I'm supposed to be focused on one task for uh, 40 minutes and daydreaming for 38 of them. And that sounds like my class. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I wondered whether there was any insights from what you discovered about how we should educate uh, people. Well, so I'm so glad you asked that. The, the model that we've had for a couple of thousand years, going back to the Greeks, of the sage on a stage imparting wisdom, um, it's, it's a failed model. It's not the way people learn. Mm. Uh, we now have data on this. And I have to apologize to you all for not practicing what I preach. I lectured at you for 20 minutes. Uh, I did what I was asked to do. Uh, uh, but that's not the best way to learn. Um, the reason is that, um, well, the evidence for it first is that uh, Students in, in college or high school settings who have gotten their course information through a lecture, just a month after their last exam, they only remember 60% of the material they remembered a month earlier, as evidenced by their exam score. And a year later, they remember 20%. And this is across all different fields of study, all different levels of universities and colleges. And the reason is that it's passive. And human beings are not evolved to be passive acquirers of information. We generally, as hunter-gatherers, acquired information actively. So what we're doing at the Minerva schools, where I'm dean of arts and humanities, and we're designing a new curriculum. This is a, new, a brand new university in California. We've only been operating for a semester. Uh, we've completely flipped the classroom upside down. The students, on their own time, have to learn the material. We give them the textbook. We give them links to TED Talks and MOOCs. Uh, uh, but we tell them, we're only going to get you started. This is what you need to know. These are, we're going to give you some of the resources, the textbook, the, the links. But you may need to, in order to understand the material, you may need to go out on your own and find other resources. You may need to discover what you need to know to learn this. And then we spend all of the class time with the students demonstrating what they learned in a novel context. We call this in cognitive psychology far transfer. It's one thing to demonstrate what you learned in a problem exactly like the one in the textbook. It's quite another to try to apply it in a novel situation. And the students who do that retain the information for life because they're actively involved in the discovery of it. Well, I think that sounds fantastic. What you should have done is we should have sent out your speech to everybody here and then they could have come in having read it and we could have yes. discussed it. That would next be fantastic. Time. Yes, next time. Um, the last question, just before I throw it out, was when I was reading your book, I, it was interesting the way you talked about neural networks in the brain and how they operate together and what we've learned about that in the last few years. And I wondered, it sprung to mind, whether there was any lessons that could be learned from the way humans organize. As opposed to? As opposed to how we do now. So lessons learned about how the brain works, because it's where you, oh, you come I across see. strongly yes. about the... Uh, um, the benefits yes, of doing I see. So. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, yeah. humans are, and, and, and actually uh, a number of animal species are natural organizers. Uh, mammals, birds organize their environment. Uh, I have a dog that uh, every once in a while, for reasons unknown to me, Uh, for reasons unknown to me, the dog wanders around the house and picks up his toys from different places and puts them in a basket where I keep them normally. The dog is tidying the environment. Uh, there are some uh, rodents uh, that uh, will set up a symmetrical pattern of rocks and pebbles and twigs around their hole in the ground. Why? Because if the symmetry is broken or the order is broken, they know there's been an intruder and they can be on the alert. So there's this propensity for organizing the world in certain ways that has evolutionary roots. What I find most fascinating about the neuroscience, uh, the architecture of, of categorization in humans is that we can categorize things in an almost infinite number of ways. There's some categories we have to learn. We have to learn what a mammal is, right? 
it, we have to be taught a bat is a mammal even though it doesn't resemble one. Uh, and then there are these other things that resemble mammals that aren't. And you know, we learn these rules. We learn that technically a cucumber and a tomato are a fruit because they have an interior seed. It's, you know, it's, it's not obvious. Um, there are other categories that we, we have intuitively in that our species has had for tens of thousands of years. Every human being intuitively understands that human versus non-human is an important categorical distinction. Male versus female, we notice that around puberty, pre-puberty. Uh, we have an intuitive sense about the difference between predators and prey, live and dead. These are natural categories they might be hardwired in the brain. They might be part of our genetic endowment. But then, as I say, there are an infinite number of ways of dividing the world. Uh, suppose I ask you what the following things have in common. Uh, your cash, your, your British pound notes, uh, your, um, your wallet, uh, your treasured family photographs, and your pet. What do they have in common? Uh, they're of value to me. They're of value to you. Yeah. Uh, now, that's probably those are four things that you may never have put together before, uh, and, and you've come up with a category: things I value. Can you think of another category that they that they all that with, that you could describe? Things them likely to be found in my house. Things likely to be found in your house. Anybody else got one? I'm trying active learning here. <laughs> Same objects, different category. Ah, oh, very nice. <laughs> Your wife gave you all the money. <laughs> very nice. I'd like to meet her. <laughs> um, the, uh, and, what, and what about this? Things to take out of the apartment in a fire. As soon as you hear it, it makes perfect sense. It's the flexibility of our category system that's extraordinary. And it, we can leverage this, understanding how it works, to better organize our homes and our workplaces. And a prime example of that is um, the junk drawer, or at least that's what we call it in the US. I don't know what you call it here, but do you all have a drawer in your house where you just put any old thing? It's often in the kitchen, right? What do you call it? Yeah, junk drawer. Junk drawer. Uh, this is actually an interesting case of cognitive economy and a great demonstration of cognitive flexibility in categorization because You've got some little thing in your hand, and there's probably a perfect place for it somewhere in your house. But what you've decided is it's not worth trying to figure it out. You just throw it in the drawer, and you know it's going to be there because your drawer has these kinds of random things. You don't obsess about it. You don't have to find the perfect little cubby hole uh, or, or section of your closet. It just goes in there, uh, and, and you're done with it. That's, that's one of the interesting things. And, and, it, and it's a great thing to have. Yeah, yeah. The indeed. miscellaneous yeah. file in your filing cabinet, same idea. Yeah, sure. Okay, great. Well, thank you. For that. I'm going to open it up now. So, if, does anyone? Wow, okay, there are a lot of questions. Um, so, you might take three at once and then you can <laughs> choose the ones to answer. So, uh, there's a microphone coming around. So, if we could just wait for the microphone. If we start off in the middle at the back here. Then. Thank you. Uh, John Bailey, Diabetes Hub. Uh, when you were performing with the Ben Folds 5, uh, were you uh, thinking straight or were you into information overload? Okay. During most of his performances, there's a lot going on, some of it improvisatory. So how does the brain deal with that, with improvising during a set structure? Well, okay. every... I'll just take a few. I'll take oh, okay. a few. Okay, just because it's got... I've made down here at the front. These are the... Thank you very much. Uh, Alison Parry, I'm a fellow. Um, it, the, I wanted also to give you another name for a junk drawer, which was a glory hole. Um, so it doesn't have to be a junk drawer. Um, what I wanted to know was really about dyslexia, because you said uh, that you were now sending students out to read things and then to do things. As a dyslexic, the whole idea of reading things completely turns me off a subject. Also with teaching, I had a history teacher who used to not allow us to take notes and we weren't allowed to look at the clock because as she said, Napoleon never clock watched. She also said to us, if you thinking about the next chapter when you're supposed to be reading this chapter, go to the next chapter and then come back. Okay, and one more, this gentleman here. 
Uh, Jeff Wolf and I'm a fellow. Um, my question is around decision making. And in this world, especially at work, where we have so much information, and you point out the volumes of information we're getting and the different policies on different things that we have to consider before making decisions, does any of your, have you got anything to say or to offer on to how to sort of cut through some of that and make, not get so swamped that you can't even make a decision on anything? Great. Well, three diverse questions then. Better decision making, this lecture, and innovation within the structure. So, John, uh, in uh, improv improvisation, the, the dirty little secret is that most musicians have some things worked out ahead of time. They don't necessarily <coughs> know how they're going to use them or whether they'll use them, but we practice a lot so that when we're asked to improvise, we've got little passages that we've been playing around with or ideas, just as when you give a talk. Uh, you've got little... Uh, I mean, I've never given this talk before, but some of the ideas I've talked about before, and, and although the sentences weren't formed ahead of time, the ideas were, and I draw on those. In, in the case of Ben, also, we planned ahead of time. We talked about what we were going to do. We set up a structure, and within that structure, there was improvisation. And I think that's the, uh, the most important point about improvisation is that it, it happens within a structure. And the tighter the structure, paradoxically, um, the more creative the uh, improv improvisation tends to be because uh, under the constraints, uh, you actually have to be creative to push at the boundaries, and the audience recognizes that. Uh, Allison, your question was about dyslexia, and this is the reason that we tell our students, you know, well, here's some YouTube videos, some TED Talks. Uh, they're certainly welcome to have audio books. They're encouraged to work together, so a dyslexic might get together with a speed reader and they can help one another because each of them comes to the material with a different understanding. I think it's important. I, I, dyslexics have a right to be educated, so we shouldn't put up uh, barriers to that. Jeff, you asked about decision-making, uh, and um, the one big idea here is that uh, the neurons that are doing the work of making a decision burn through glucose in the process of, of sorting things out. And unfortunately, it takes almost as much glucose uh, to make a trivial decision as a super important one. There's almost no difference. So if I ask you whether you want a piece of spearmint gum or peppermint gum, that decision process is going to use up as much energy as um, a friend of yours has just been diagnosed with cancer. Here are the outcomes for radiation. Here are the outcomes for surgery. You can see the five-year outcomes, the 10-year outcomes, the risks which you're going to choose, uh, same amount of energy. So the, to give you a practical tip here, uh, the best strategy is to make your important decisions early in the day, prioritize them, make the less important decisions later in the day because you're not uh, at your peak then. That's a good tip. Okay, if you can come over this side. So a gentleman here. Yeah, my name is Keith Raffin. I, um, yesterday. Oh, I'm sorry, one other thing for Jeff, if, okay. if, if you don't mind. Uh, I worked through some examples in the book of something called Bayesian inferencing, uh, discovered by the Reverend Bayes, uh, British, uh, well, minister and statistician. And it's a very powerful technique for making um, more rational, evidence based decisions. Uh, it's visual, it's not particularly mathematical. Uh, and any high school student can learn it in an hour. I, I worked through several examples in the book, and I think if nothing else, uh, that's, that's uh, worth the price of the book. And if you don't agree, I'll give you your money back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, <clears throat> I'm a great procrastinator and leave things to the last minute. Your name again? Uh, Keith Raffin. Keith. And um, yesterday I was unexpectedly landed with something which I didn't really want to do, and that is to speak at the commemoration of somebody's life. And the person's partner asked me to do it. I didn't think I was well qualified. But in the middle of last night, and I knew you know, what was going to happen, that I'd have to drop everything or I'd do it at the last minute. And in the middle of last night, I woke up. And a lot of stuff seemed to have gone on in my mind while I was asleep. And I wrote it down. I'm glad I wrote it down, because I would have forgotten it otherwise. And actually, by this, by this morning, I had the kind of framework of what I wanted to do. That's one example. And the second is this. I find that I'm probably more creative when I'm out walking. I mean, probably because I have no distractions, but you know, my mind is working there, and maybe it's the same as sleep. I don't know whether there is a similarity or a connection, but you know, I find that 
you know, that I'm able to resolve things and perhaps also write things in my mind, speeches or whatever that I have to make. Is there a question in that or is that observation? Okay. Um, oh, well, yeah. I could. We'll take three and then. Cause I think, uh, right here. Uh, my name's Lee, interested civilian. Uh, my question is, is information addictive? And if so, kind of what impact does it have on the brain and mind? And how does it Thank affect you, us? Right, and then over here, um, at the end, third row back. Thank you. Um, Adrian Kassar, um, Adrian? interested, uh, ex-military. So I was just interested in, uh, the, if you could enlighten us on anything that the Joint Chiefs had to say about this, because uh, they're, they're interested in their decision-making cycles and the philosophy that if you can make your decision faster than your enemies, then you're on the up. Your name was Adrian? Yes. Um, so, uh, Keith, uh, there is a science of procrastination. I devote... Uh, uh, good part of a chapter to it, to why we procrastinate and how to overcome it. Uh, we procrastinate for different reasons. One is that it's unpleasant. Uh, another is we don't know where to start. Uh, we haven't broken up into little bitty pieces. Uh, and there are some strategies for overcoming it. Uh, the, the big thing is that um, if it's unpleasant, uh, the Mark Twain strategy, he called it eat the frog. Do the most unpleasant thing you have to do first thing in the morning, the rest of the day you're free. Um, the, uh, the point you made about walks has been well documented. We don't really understand why, but taking a walk engages this mind-wandering mode, that default mode that I mentioned to you, especially a walk in nature. Uh, it's very restorative. Danny Kahnem and my colleague that, who won the Nobel Prize and wrote the excellent book Thinking Fast and Slow conducted most of the Nobel Prize winning research by, while taking walks. I mean, he conceived of it while taking walks. Uh, Lee, um, your question was about... Is information addictive? Is information addictive? Yes, and it is. Um, the, uh, the reason is that we've evolved novelty detectors, uh, which makes perfect sense over evolutionary timescales. New information is usually helpful, but you know, thousands of years ago, uh, as we were evolving these novelty detectors, tens of thousands of years ago, there wasn't that much new. I mean, new things came along at a very slow pace. First, you know, we discover the wheel, and then 10,000 years go by and we discover fire, and it's another 10,000 years before we have language. I mean, you know, it's, a, it, it's not a, the kind of world we're talking about now. Um, and the problem is that novelty triggers this evolved uh, dopamine uh, loop. You get a little shot of dopamine, the so-called pleasure hormone, every time you encounter something new because it's adaptive to orient to something new. My colleague Peter Milner at McGill many years ago did an experiment where uh, rats were given the opportunity to self-stimulate to produce dopamine. You may have read about this. It was a famous study in the 1950s. The rats press a bar, they get a little shot of dopamine. They press the bar again, a little more dopamine, right to the brain. Uh, and what he found was they pressed the bar over and over again to the exclusion of eating and drinking and sleeping and everything else, and they ended up dying. And uh, it's because of this dopamine addiction loop. And if the picture that you have in your mind of those rats pressing that bar over and over again reminds you of someone you know compulsively checking your, their email, <laughs> or, oh, I just made a Facebook post. How many thumbs up do I have? How many now? How many now? How many now? That's the addictive nature of information. Uh, Adrian. Joint Chiefs of Staff. Right. Yeah. Sorry. I'm, I'm overloaded here. <laughs> <laughs> I had to make a choice between the name and the question. I apologize. Uh, the, the Joint Chiefs, um, members of the Joint Chiefs whom I spoke to, one of their principles, two principles that I found very illuminating, they make perfect sense. It's one of those things you hear at you, well, of course. One is don't waste more time on a decision than it's worth. So, uh, I mean, we all do this anyway. When's the, how many of you have balanced your checkbook in the last month? In a room this size, 120 people, two people, right? Most of us don't do it anymore. We used to, but now that there's computerized banking, uh, and it's not just a person you know, sending you your statement, 
It, it's very unusual that there'd be uh, an error of any consequence. And if it was a big error, you'd notice it in sort of your monthly total. You might glance at the monthly total, but you don't actually balance. Why? Because what are you going to do? You're going to find that you, there, the bank uh, is off by 29 cents, and it's going to take you an hour to discover that. It's not worth it. Uh, if you hear that there's a sale on something that you want to buy, and you have to cross London in order to save a pound, and it's going to take you two hours over and back, are you going to do it? Most people wouldn't. You, t you don't spend more time on a decision or, or an operation than it's worth. Uh, the other thing is, uh, they talked about, I got this from um, General McChrystal, who was the head of the Joint Operations Forces. Um, he said, one of the important things in decision making is to know which question to ask to move the conversation forward. And he wasn't always very good at this, but by being around people who were, he learned to do this, uh, to think of which question uh, will actually uh, provide you the information you need. And he gave me an example that I have right here, uh, I believe. Right, so when he first gets to Iraq, uh, he's got a number of mission commanders who report to him, and they have a teleconference kind of Skype meeting, and they're reviewing what's going on. And what he wants to know is for each sector, you know, there's 30 different mission com commanders around Iraq. For each sector, uh, one of the questions he had for them was, what intelligence sources do you have on the ground? In other words, what local Iraqis uh, do you have who can provide information to you that we're not able to get on our own? And one mission commander uh, boasted that he had 250 local sources. Uh, far and away, you know, more than any other mission commander. You know, this, this impressed McChrystal. And so uh, he's thinking, this guy really, we have to learn what he's done and replicate that all over the rest of the country uh, for the duration of the conflict. Um, so this guy had recruited 250 Iraqi citizens to pass information on to US forces. Uh, now, McChrystal's intelligence officer, from whom he learned a lot about what question to ask, his intelligence officer at the time, Mike Flynn, asked a simple but important question that really moved this whole thing forward. Flynn says, uh, Colonel Flynn, uh, to this op mission commander, describe your best source. Now he whispers, whispers to McChrystal, I'm assuming that the other one, you know, 249 are not as good as the best one. So you know, let's, let's figure out how good the best one is. Well, after a series of questions and answers and conversation that unfolded over the next 10 minutes, turn out the best source isn't any good at all. <laughs> not reliable, doesn't show up to appointments, about half the information doesn't check out. So you realize you got nothing, right? Uh, asking the question that moves things forward uh, is a great strategy for making better decisions. When, yeah, and, and you have to practice to do this. You, over this side then, um, at the back there. Yeah, thanks. This follows on from, hello, I'm Phil Harding. I'm a journalist, although I'm for, unfortunately a male journalist. Um, <laughs> this follows on from what you said they about the- They do have operations, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, depending on how ambitious you are in your profession. <laughs> I'm looking into it. It's, 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 I'm working on it. This, this question follows on I don't know if the government health plan <laughs> covers these. We've got a doctor here, though, I think. Uh, I'm sorry. The, Phil, the, the, yeah. This question, operation or not, this question follows on from what you were saying about the rats and dopamine. Um, we, we appear to be becoming addicted to our tablets, to our mobile phones, and so on and so forth. Um, if what you're describing really is an addiction, that then becomes, as you said, highly destructive. Is the logic of what you're saying that we're going to have to rethink the world of work and indeed the way that we are conducting our lives at the moment? Thank you. Um, just behind us. Hi, I'm Nico McDonald. I'm a fellow. Um, I'm going to follow up and slightly contradict my colleague Phil's question there, because I think you're in danger of medicalizing social phenomena. Uh, when the term addiction is used uh, so promiscuously these days, as is the term promiscuous, I guess, uh, <laughs> we've got to worry a bit about whether social phenomena are being misunderstood. I think the idea of novelty detection that you referred to earlier on is an example of this. Now, actually, we've had access to more information than we can deal with or use for most of the modern era. You know, I could have gone to the British Library 150 years ago and been overwhelmed or overloaded by your information. 
Um, the reality is, and we've actually been talking about this for quite a long time, Richard Sewell Woman wrote Information Anxiety 20 years ago now. And my challenge to you is actually, it's not information overload as much as what I would call paradigm underload, in the sense that we don't know where to focus our research into information, and we don't know how to contextualize it and give it meaning. And that's very evident in our society where there are no grand narratives, as the French theorists used to call them. There are no big ideas which help people to you know, understand society. And thus, everything seems to have equal meaning and importance, and thus, no importance. So I'm not so sure it's a, a phenomenon that's you know, a, a, you know, the age of information. It's a phenomenon of the age of lack of paradigms. That would be my challenge to you. Thank you. And then lastly, uh, over in the corner, woman in green. Valila Liotti, fellow. Uh, I'd like to ask what is the equivalent of uh, daydreaming for teams? So for people together, working Great. together. Thank you very much. So Phil, restructuring the workplace, uh, and Kevin, paradigm underload, I think are really two ways of talking about the same thing. I heartily agree with both of you, and I think that um, uh, the convergence here is that we do need to approach our work and our home and our leisure life uh, differently than we have been. We, don't, we are underloaded on the tools to do this. Uh, Kevin, I, I take your point that um, this same cry about uh, information overload has been going on for a very long time. Seneca of the ancient Greeks complained about writing and said that the written word will rot men's minds because they no longer will engage in the art of conversation. Uh, and then when the first books came about uh, in ancient times, uh, oh, you, it's not just that you're writing things down now, but there's books. The peripheral, peripheration of books is going to cause a weakening of the spirit and the intellect. And you know, not to mention when the Gutenberg Press came out, people said, uh, scholarly people, there's going to be so many things not worth reading. Uh, that the average person will become stupid. And then, of course, there was radio and television and computer games and the Internet. So there's this sense of same as it ever was, right? But uh, in a world where we now have more information being created every couple of years than in all of human history before it, I think we do need to restructure the workplace, as Phil said, uh, become more uh, skillful in adopting uh, useful paradigms. And, and I would say primary among those is uh, we have to self-blinker. We have to enforce some discipline on ourselves to uh, focus on, to prioritize our tasks, focus on certain things, uh, and not allow, not allow ourselves to be standing directly in front of the fire hose of information so that we get knocked over. Stand off to the side and just take out a little bit of, of water when you need it and get the water that you actually need. Sorry to bend that metaphor out of shape. but. Um, I think that's the secret. Uh, and the dreaming for teams. question here, about, yes, about um, the dream mode for teams, there's this um, idea about brainstorming uh, in the workplace where everybody gets together and they, uh, they are unconstrained by uh, logic or uh, other factors, thinking outside the box. People just generate ideas. Uh, that's been shown um, over and over again uh, to really not work well. <laughs> but uh, what, uh, getting back to McChrystal, uh, he's got a consulting company now. Uh, they have an open floor plan. Uh, they, and this works very well for startup companies, consulting companies, media organizations where uh, people need to exchange and share information with one another in real time, the newsroom being a classic example. Um, it's not so much that you're daydreaming together, but you're exchanging information. Uh, and sure, I guess there's some value in a team having a quiet moment where everybody can reflect and then exchange ideas again. But um, the important thing is to recognize that this kind of unconstrained brainstorming uh, often leads to a lot of useless ideas. What's better is if each person comes up with some ideas on their own, tests them out for whether they're plausible before blurting them out, uh, which is what brainstorming is, and then, and then exchange. Great. And time for just a few more questions. So we down here. Thanks. Hello, Monica. 
this on? Yeah. Hello, Monica Dunkel. Um, I wonder, as you said, focusing, and you mentioned this insular point. So, is there any tips on really, you know, focusing from a brain perspective? So maybe touching it, or you know, to prevent this switching of uh, the multitasking you mentioned. Thanks. Maybe just in front. David Wood, London Futurist. The advice you've given today has been based on recent uh, brain research or our current knowledge about the brain, but are there new things that you expect we should be finding out about the brain which would, uh, once we do discover them, would uh, change our best ideas now to cope with information? So in other words, what is the research areas that you are asking your team to look into as regards how the brain is doing things we currently don't understand? Okay. And then actually down the front, lady in... Thank you very much. My name's um, Sally. Uh, and you've talked about um, the value of daydreaming in letting the mind wander. I wondered if you'd say a few things about the value or otherwise of meditation and mindfulness, where it's very much about not letting the mind wander and bringing it back to the present moment. Thank you. So uh, being able to maintain concentration um, and, and keep that switch in one position, I think the best strategy is to um, practice what David Allen, the efficiency guru, calls the mind clearing exercise. Uh, once or twice a day, uh, write down everything that's in your head. Get all that chatter out there. Oh, I have to pick up milk on the way home. I promised Aunt Tilly I'd call her back. Uh, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. Just write it all down, get it out of your head. Then when you're trying to focus, you'll find you're less distracted. Also, if you can, turn off your email for an hour. Um, the composers that I know, the writers that I know, Jonathan Franzen said, no novelist is going to write a good novel while, while they even have an internet connection. Uh, it's just impossible because of the distraction. David, you asked about the work that's going on that I think is most important. Uh, there's an effort called the Connectome Project to try and understand uh, how uh, knowledge is encapsulated in the connections of the brain. Up until this point, we've mainly looked at which parts of the brain are active and what neural circuits. We haven't looked at the connections. Uh, Sebastian Sung has written an, a, a very good book about this called Connectome. Uh, we're not at the point where we're very good at mapping the human connectome. Uh, we don't have the technology. We will soon. We're now mapping the connectome of C. elegans, a famous worm in biology. Um, uh, and in the case of my own research, I've redirected the efforts of my lab uh, in the last couple of years uh, from neuroanatomy uh, to neurochemistry. So we do studies where we manipulate chemicals in the brain in order to understand their effect, and we try to manipulate them in a targeted fashion. This old notion that the brain is just a sack of chemicals uh, is, is not a, an accurate or helpful model. But it's the model on which antidepressants are based, and this is why they don't work so well. You probably know that antidepressants tend to work in only half of the times they're prescribed. So you go to the doctor, you get Zoloft, it doesn't work, you come back a month later, the doctor gives you Prozac, that doesn't work, you come back a month later, you get Wellbutrin, 50% chance each time that it's going to work. Not very good odds. It's because the brain's not just a sack of chemicals where you can just change one chemical globally. As an example, dopamine, the chemical I mentioned earlier, it does different things depending on which part of the brain it's in. So when it's in the center of the brain in the nucleus accumbens in the ventral tegmental area, it gives you a feeling of pleasure. When it's in the prefrontal cortex, it helps you concentrate. So you were asking if you're having trouble concentrating because you've got ADD or you just have a friendly doctor who'll give you the stuff, you can get methylphenidate, Ritalin, which promotes dopamine uh, throughout the brain, but primarily targets the receptors in the prefrontal cortex and helps you concentrate. I'm not recommending that you take it without medical need. Uh, I'm just saying. Uh, Sally asked about mindfulness and meditation, and um, these work very, very well for people who can do them, right? Not everybody can. We are all different from one another. But uh, mindfulness, the, uh, the focus that comes from that, the intentionality, meditation are just as restorative as mind wandering and naps because they're, they're invoking this same default mode. Brilliant. Well, I'm afraid that's all the time we, 
we have today. I know there's a lot of people wanting to ask questions, but we didn't get around to it. Um, so your book, The Organised Minds, I think it's available outside. I think you'll be signing copies. It's, it's a good read. It's a good read of science and practical tips. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, but just say, so finally, to everyone, please uh, join me in thanking once again uh, Daniel Levitin. Thank you.